Welcome back to um, the AP Psychology Lecture Part 2 on Chapter 14, Stress and Health. Um, today we're going to pick up with coping with stress. Um, there are several different ways that a person can cope with stress, strategies and methods, um, but a person has to have resources in order to be able to cope with that stress and part of that is time. Um, if a person doesn't have enough time, that can be a stressor in and of itself, but you have to be able to have time to deal with the things that are causing you stress and also money, especially if you're going to seek out assistance for that stress um, coping. So there are several different strategies for coping with stress. You can have a cognitive coping strategy and that um, an example of that would be cognitive restructuring. And that basically means just changing the way you think about something. So if you see something as a negative, you try and change the way you think about it so you can view it as a positive or maybe a challenge um, as opposed to something that is um, uh, taking away from your life. You've got emotional coping strategies. That would be an example of that would be like going to your friends, um, venting to your friends or complaining to your friends or even seeing if your friends have ways to help you deal with a problem. So social support. And there are also social support groups that help with that too. A behavioral example of that would be like time management, being able to say, okay, how am I going to be allotting my time so that I can achieve everything I need to achieve at this time period? Um, and then there are physical coping strategies, um, something like progressive relaxation training where a person uses um, techniques of deep breathing um, to be able to relax themselves more and more. Um, and those that are able to change their coping strategies, so you use a different way to deal with your stress depending on what the source of stress is, are gonna be more successful. So if you use the same approach across the board, you're probably not gonna be as successful as dealing with or get rid of, getting rid of your stress as you are if you tailor make the way, uh, tailor make the way that you address that stress based on what the, the source of that stress is. So coping methods, m coping methods problem. Uh, focused coping methods. This is going to say, okay, we're going to get rid of the source of the stress. How do I get rid of um, the thing that's causing me stress? And sometimes you don't have control over, um, you know, the sources of those stress. You know, teachers going to assign you homework. You've got four tests on one day. You've got a big project. You also have to work. You know, a lot of times you don't have a way to eliminate the source of that stress. So maybe then you're going to go to an emotion-focused coping method. Um, this is going to say, okay, if I'm going to deal with whatever consequences of that stressor are emotional. So how does it make me feel? Well, there are some bad strategies, what we call maladaptive strategies. That would be smoking, drinking, um, using aggression or taking out that aggression on someone else, using drugs, spending money to try and raise your mood, things like that. Um, there are also good emotion-focused coping methods, which would be sharing your feelings, um, assessing those feelings, trying to change those feelings. Um, people who are able to use problem-focused coping methods and identify what they have control over and what they don't have control over. So to be able to identify what is an internal locus of control versus what an external locus of control are better able to deal with stress that they have and they're more likely to not be affected in a negative way by that stress. And of course it's important to have a social support network um, so that people who are around you during stress can help lessen that load. Um, and sometimes though if you have too much support that can backfire. Um, and take a moment right now to think about how having too much support might backfire for you. It's possible that if someone is supporting you too much, then they could be kind of, you could be either relying on them um, to solve your problems, or perhaps you are um, actually overstressed by the fact that someone else is trying to solve your problems or is in your business all the time. So that's a couple ways that that could be uh, backfiring. Now stress, the way that we respond to stress is certainly dependent on our personality and it's also very dependent on our gender. Um, and one of the things that we look at when we look at personality is what we call um, optimism or pessimism. So dispositional optimism means a person basically looks at the glass half full. They certainly think that things are going to work out well. Maybe they focus on the positives of a scenario. And this dispositional optimism, people who tend to see you know, the sunny side of life tend to have fewer illnesses. They tend to heal faster from when they do get hurt or do have illnesses. Um, and they see, if they're able to see that stressors are temporary, you just got to get through it. Um, maybe um, you know the stressor is helping you to get to where you're supposed to be later on, they tend to have fewer stress-related problems than those who see it as a permanent problem or see it um, more in a negative light. 
Uh, Friedman and Rosenman, who are two psychologists, who, they started as uh, cardiologists, but they end up doing psychology work in 1956. They look at how stress is related to personality and how that can impact uh, the incidence of heart disease. And so they are the two that identify type A and type B personalities. Um, they say type A people, of course, are very competitive. They're very impatient. Um, they uh, are very sometimes aggressive. Um, sometimes they're um, just assertive. They're much more likely to engage in types of behaviors that are consistent with um, uh, high energy. Um, whereas type B people are a lot more easygoing. They're a lot more relaxed, kind of go with the flow type personality. And they tend to have less incidence of stress and heart disease. And in the year 2000, Johan Denolier, I assume, uh, defined type D personalities, um, the D standing for distressed. So this would be a distressed person, someone who has, who is typically um, distressed, almost always having negative emotions, social inhibition, not wanting to reach out to other people. Um, and this person also has a very high risk of heart disease. Now it's not just our personality, which of course we'll study more in chapter 15, next chapter, but it's also our gender um, that influences the way that people are going to cope with stress. You probably see this all the time if you have friends that are both of male and female or if you're dating somebody or whatever. Um, Shelly Taylor comes up with the, the idea of tend and befriend. Um, and she says that women tend to help others and they tend to rely on others much more when they're stressed out. And men have a tendency to um, avoid the stressors, or sometimes they'll get angry, or sometimes they'll do all of those things. Um, so women tend to reach out to others, while men tend to kind of uh, shun others when they're stressed out. So if you want to pause right here, you can access the personality inventory on Blackboard, and you can see whether you are a type A person or a type B person, or you can also determine whether or not uh, you have uh, an aggressive tendency. Okay, welcome back. Um, now we're going to be moving on to the physiology and the psychology, the combination of the two relating to health and illness. So let's look at the immune system. Psychoneuroimmunology, that's the field that's going to look at how does the body and the mind, how do those, and behavior as well, how do those things combine to affect the body's ability to fight off illnesses. Um, so we have to look at the immune system. Of course, you know, the immune system is the thing that fights off the illnesses. Um, any kind of bad organism or any kind of bad infection that we have is going to be fought off by the immune system. Um, we've got a lot of components there. We've got leukocytes. That includes the B cells and the T cells. Um, the antibodies that the B cells produce, and that was, is what actually fights off the invasion, the disease that we have, the germs. And then we have the natural killer cells, the macrophages. Um, and when a person has uh, a lot of stress, this can change the functioning of the immune system. It actually decreases the functioning of the immune system um, because the nervous system, the central nervous system and the autonomic nervous systems um, affect the endocrine system, the, produ the production of hormones uh, that are available for our bodies to fight off disease. Um, and people who are stressed are much more likely to develop these infectious diseases, such as AIDS, um, because the immune system is suppressed. Um, ultimately, what happens is we have, um, we have uh, pathogens. Pathogens are germs. And then there are antigens. Antigens are, um, uh, uh, they travel with the germs, okay? So the antigens tell your immune system that something bad is in the body. The antigens communicate with the T cells in your body. They tell the T cells, hey, um, you're being invaded. And then the T cells tell the B cells that they should be producing a particular kind of antibody. And then the B cells produce that antibody that then attacks the pathogen, the germ, um, in order to fight off that illness. So let's check for understanding what impact does stress have on the immune system. Think about that for a second. And we'll move on. So how do we stay healthy? Um, it's important to be able to stay healthy. In fact, there are several um, views, there are two major views on looking at uh, uh, sick people. You can either look at the sick people and what makes them sick, or you can look at the healthy people and what keeps them healthy. So how can we promote healthy behavior, which is kind of the trend that psychology has gone um, towards when it comes to stress and health. Um, and uh, Erwin Rosenstock created what we call the health belief model. And this is based on the idea that there are four main factors that people will base their health related behavior on. People are gonna see, do I think that I'm actually gonna get sick? So what's the perceived pers personal threat of the illness? Do I really feel like there's a threat to me personally? 
Also, how serious is this illness? Is it something that is really serious and severe, or is it something that's like, eh, it's a cold, maybe it'll be a couple of weeks? Then, do I really believe that doing something is going to reduce the threat? Um, if, you, if you don't believe in hand sanitizer, you don't believe hand sanitizer is going to actually kill any germs to keep you well, you're not going to use it. But if you do believe hand sanitizer is going to kill the germs and keep you uh, from getting sick, a cold or the flu or whatever, you're much more likely to use it and use it frequently. And then what's the balance between the health practice and the benefits of that health practice. So in other words, um, is it something that is a huge pain in the ass? Is there a big cost to you either monetarily or uh, through effort? If it costs you too much, too much effort is put forth for you to do this particular thing to keep yourself from getting sick, you're not gonna do it. Um, so all four of those things combine in order to determine whether or not a person's gonna do some sort of health-related behavior, like hand washing, okay, um, which is a health-related behavior. In addition, people need to believe that you can change your behavior. If you have self-efficacy, an internal locus of control, if you believe you can do that, you're much more likely to change that behavior. And there are stages of readiness there. Um, if you're going to change your behavior, okay, you have to be able to be ready to undertake that activity. So there's five stages in stages of readiness for changing your behavior. First, we got pre-contemplation. An example of pre-contemplation is you're just kind of starting to think about it. You see a Nike ad for running on TV, and the thought gets in your brain. You're like, oh, I'm running. Running might be good for me. Okay. And then you get to contemplation. So you start seriously thinking about it. Um, this is really going to help me. Um, I'm going to extend my endurance. I might lose some weight. I'm certainly going to be a, a healthier, more fit person. Then you start to prepare. OK, when am I going to run? I need some running shoes. It's cold outside. I need to make sure I have some running gear. OK, so there are a lot of different things that go involved to be able to have the right uh, materials to, to whatever this behavior is. And then we have action. You actually have to go do it. Um, unfortunately, you can have all the workout clothes in the world, but if they're just sitting in your drawer, they're not doing a thing for you. And then finally, you get to maintenance. Um, once you actually have done the thing once or twice, um, you got to continue to do it. Um, and that's why we see um, in January, people have all of this wonderful, oh, pre-contemplation, it's great, I'm totally going to lose some weight, I'm going to get in shape, it's going to be awesome. Um, they start to really seriously think about what they need for that. Um, they contemplate it, and then they prepare. They go buy that gym membership, they buy their new workout clothes, they are, they're ready to go. Um, and then they go to the gym for probably about two to three weeks, maybe. Um, the problem is you have to maintain that. Um, and we'll see a huge drop off in gym membership after the month of January because people are like, eh, not really not worth changing you know, my life that much. So you have to continue to do that. You have to maintain it. And you have to be able to transition from one stage to the next, um, as it says, when a decisional balance is achieved. That means when the pros outweigh the cons. Okay, so you have to be able to see more of the benefit than the pain in the rear it takes to be able to get your hind parts to the gym to actually run on the treadmill or go to a class or lift weights or whatever yours is you're deciding to do in this particular example. Okay, well, do you understand it? If you do not understand it, this would be a wonderful time for you to prepare some questions of things that you don't get that you can come ask me either after class, during uh, Wolverine time, after school, or even during class. Beginning class would be a great time um, because that is the end. Or is it? We'll be moving on to Chapter 15 very shortly. See you guys then.